So next is supranational law. Supranational law is where countries draw up a treaty and agree that in case of any dispute, they would be governed by an independent international court, which may be regional, but not from within their domestic jurisdiction. For example, the best example of this is European Union. You have the European Union, and in case there is any problem, any dispute there, you know, the countries have decided that they would, uh, you know, knock the doors of the European Court of Justice instead of their individual courts, depending upon what matter it is. And, uh, you know, in case it is, uh, you know, matters which are within the European countries. So they would knock the doors of the European Court of Justice. So this is supranational law. This is an example of supranational law, where countries draw up a treaty and agree that in case of any dispute, they would be governed by you know, an independent international court. For example, I've given you just an example, European Court of Justice. What are the sources of international law? Again, this is also the introduction part of it, sources of international law. In the very beginning of this class, I said, what are the sources of international law? Source in the sense from where did international law, you know, from where did it get its, you know, content or from where did it actually, from what source did it emanate from? What is the source of it? From where did it come actually? So the International Court of Justice under ICJ Statute Article 38 Clause 1 classifies three sources of international law. One is treaties, customs, and general principles. So these may be considered as primary sources of international law. In addition, some other secondary sources are judicial precedents. That is, judicial precedents are judicial precedents are laws by the courts or the decisions that are given by the courts. So that is judicial precedents. Then, uh, non-binding legal instruments or contracts juris and public opinions and other general principles of international law. Then Article 38 subclause 1 of ICJ statute recognizes judicial decisions and scholarly writings also as subsidiary means for the determination of the law. So they are saying that even scholarly writings or you know could be a subsidiary source of law, source of international law. The next source is Treat, of course, now going back to the slide. I said that three main sources or three primary sources of international law is treaties, customs, and general principles. So in the subsequent slides, we are just going to see the main sources that is treaties, customs, and general principles. Secondary sources, of course, I've just mentioned here that is publicist opinion, jurist opinion, non-binding legal instrument, judicial principles or judicial precedents and other general principles of international law. They are subsidiary means or subsidiary uh, you know, uh, sources. What are these treaties, conventions and charters? I'm sure you know this as well. Now, these refer to express instruments or a kind of covenants that are drawn up to which terms the signatories to the treaty agree to be bound. It means there are parties to the treaty. They, of course, the parties to the treaty are normally countries or member countries or countries rather states. And the states who are signed the particular treaty or they are signatory to it, they are called as members to the treaty. So treaties are drawn up. They are kind of agreements. They have covenants in them. So they are kind of an agreement or an arrangement between nations who agree to follow by a particular protocol. So they are kind of legal instruments to which the parties to the treaty who sign the treaty, they are called the parties to the treaty, they are called the signatories to the treaty, they agree to be bound by the treaty. So treaties may be bilateral or multilateral, bilateral, of course, between two nations. That means if, if it's a bilateral treaty, then the nations that are signing the treaty, the signatories, of course, you know, they are bound by it. While some other treaties which are multilateral, 
Of course, it would be between countries or nations, which may be more than two countries, and it can go even more than 150 countries. An example of that would be Geneva Convention, which has more than 150 states as parties to it. So parties to the treaty are bound by it, and thereby the Latin maxim, which is very important for you to know, listen to me carefully, the Latin maxim that really governs this aspect of treaties is pacta sunt servanda, which means the terms of the agreement must be kept. It's pacta sunt servanda, which means the terms of the agreement must be kept. It's there right there in the slide, in the paragraph which talks about treaties, the last sentence, pacta sunt servanda, which means terms of the agreement must be kept. Then the next source of international law is customs. Again, the Statute of International Court of Justice has identified customs as well, you know, as important source of law. And they're saying that important source of international law. And they're saying that what are customs? They're saying it's the evidence of general practices established by law. I'm repeating, they're saying it's the evidences or like it's a proof of general practice. That means a proof of certain practice which is widely accepted by a certain group of people or a particular nation so it is accepted widely so that means it, it is there is a custom in a particular nation it's widely accepted so that becomes a law so customs fundamentally imply two factors one wide prevalence it's widely there and the practice of a particular custom it's not a customer there's a mistake there it's a custom by prevalence and practice of a particular custom and to general acceptance of that custom to the extent of consistent usage and longer duration consistent usage in the sense they should shouldn't be breaks in that it should be consistently used a custom should be you know consistent and it should be of longer duration now icj that is the international court of justice requires that for a custom to be proved it should be in constant and uniform usage this is the phrase that it has used constant and uniform usage the third source is general principles of law and as per the icj statute general principles of law are those that are recognized as such by the nations and such principles may arise by laws or customs evidenced in practice that means you can literally see it and it is established either by municipal law or domestic law or even international law. I'm repeating, it is established by municipal law or, or domestic law or even international law. Municipal law or domestic law, that's one, or even international law. For example, principles of justice, equity, and good conscience is an established principle of law and it is recognized in most jurisdictions and, of course, even in international law. Even, for example, in the law of contract, the principle of justice, equity, and good conscience is like used everywhere. And uh, there is, uh, I, I'm not sure whether you have heard of this principle of promissory estoppel or the doctrine of promissory estoppel. It's not part of this. I'm talking about the law of contracts, for example. So the doctrine of promissory estoppel is like it's drawn on the principles of equity. And again, you know, it's widely uh, recognized principle. The principles of equity is widely recognized, especially by the English courts. And of course, worldwide, I mean, most jurisdictions, at least I can say that the principles of equity is actually accepted. Next is conclusion. Of course, there are certain norms and principles that are significant to the extent that can never be done away with or ignored or set aside. That means it can never be done away with. It can never be set aside. Such principles are called as use cogents. Now, use cogent in Latin simply means compelling law. And in English, it simply means preemptory rom, norm, preemptory norm. What is preemptory norm? A preemptory norm is something that is absolutely essential. It cannot be set aside. It has to be done. Something that has to be followed in international law is called as use cogents. What is example of that? The right of a person to be protected from torture. It's use cogents. Are you understanding me? Right of a person to be protected from torture. It's use cogents. It is something that has to be followed. That is use cogents. So the question that will come before the international courts of law, especially like ICJ or even international criminal court. So there are certain questions that may come up before the court while they are solving cases. The question that can come before the court is, 
Euscogens, is it a euscogen? Is it something that has to be followed? Is it that something that has to be followed? For example, if there's a person who is tortured or there is slave trade that is going on. Slave trade is obliterated. It is actually now um, a big international offense. Slave trade is not permitted. Slave trade is actually already you know, plotted off. So it is a crime. So, uh, you know, suppose there are people who are engaging in slavery. There are people who are torturing human beings. So that is, again, it comes within the ambit of use coaching. You're not supposed to treat any human being, you know, you should not, you're not supposed to torture a human being. You should treat a human being as a human, right? So the, the UDHR Charter, I'm sure you know about the UDHR Charter, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948. I'm sure you know about that. And it lays down a number of beautiful principles about human rights. So of course, there are certain things that come within the ambit of use cogens. That means something that cannot be really um, you know, set aside or done away with. Now, what is diplomacy? So in the beginning of the class, I told you what is diplomacy. I said that diplomacy and international law are like sisters or brothers and whatever way you want to call it. But by and large, simply it means that they are interconnected. They are, you know, uh, what they say, they are interdependent. So diplomacy and international law, they are interconnected and they are interdependent. Why? I would say that if there was no diplomacy, I don't think there would have been international law as well, because diplomacy is all about relationships, how these diplomats, they represent the, the countries and their particular country and how they represent their country to the world. It's a kind of a, you know, a, a kind of a legal or a social legal practice by which, you know, the countries interact with each other. You know, and that they take the support of international law of the nations and then they, you know, they participate in certain meetings, certain conventions, then they explain and justify their position or their stand. And then they come up with a particular, you know, decision that needs to be implemented. So that is that is the role of a diplomat. And I told you who is the father of diplomacy. I put it in the chat there. He's Leopold von Rank. And by his name, you would understand it's not difficult. He is a German historian and a philosopher way back from the 19th century. So diplomacy here, as per the slide, is a harbinger of globalization, fortified foreign policies, and international relationship. Why we are saying that diplomacy is a harbinger of, you know, globalization, fortified foreign policies, and international relations? Simply because we needed, we need representatives to represent our country at, you know, at the highest level to, you know, enter or engage into talks with an, some other country. Maybe it could be with respect to solving a conflict or solving a dispute. It could be a border dispute. It could be some war-connected problem. Like for example. You see, like if you talk about border disputes, can you give me an example of any country which has border dispute? Can you give me an example of any country that has border dispute? Russia and Ukraine. Yeah, good. And then we have um, Azerbaijan and Armenia. You see? So there are border disputes. And sometimes even within the country, they have you know, territorial disputes. Probably there's a river that is passing through some other country, sorry, another country, within a particular country and between two territorial states. And again, they have disputes there to whom the you know, river belongs. Like for example, in India, there is a dispute about a river called as Kaveri, where there is two states which are fighting over that river, like the state of Karnataka and there's a state of Tamil Nadu. So one state is saying it is our river, the other state is saying it's our river, and then there is a dam and there's all sort of confusion which is going on until now they are still disputing and it's going on for years together. Again, India, Pakistan, again, there is a, you know, uh, there is a border dispute, of course, border disputes, again, China, India, and so on. So there's a lot of problems which are going on, but of course, by now it is kind of resolved, resolved in the sense it is quiet, but um, 
yeah, of course, we'll not go into the politics part of it, but this is just an example in international law that I'm trying to give that there are border disputes between the nations. So who represents us is, of course, the, you know, the, the leaders of the nation. And there are, in addition, there are professional diplomats of high ranking, uh, like, you know, there are officers of high ranking who, you know, they represent the country. So what that is how we are saying that international law and diplomacy are interrelated. Diplomacy is a means of building relationship it is an art it is and it is an art and when well executed with a skill it really yields good results it is an art to negotiate significant matters concerning states international affairs and law and diplomacy as i said earlier as siblings and international law cannot develop without diplomacy again in my view, and thereby it is said that international law and diplomacy are interconnected and interdependent. Nations have strengthened their ties with the aid of diplomacy. It aids in advancing foreign policies. Diplomats orchestrate their plans and strategies in their prudence. That means they, you know, they um, really strategize their plans. They really root their plans in a way, in their wisdom, in their prudence, to build international political relationship. And thus they fortify or they strengthen concrete international diplomatic relations between nations. For example, um, you say any other country, like let me give an example of USA and India. So they have strengthened their relationship with each other or USA and UK, they have good relation with each other. UAE and India, they are like best friends. So United Arab Emirates and India, they are very good friends. So like it all happens with the help of diplomats. It, it, it is diplomacy, international diplomacy. They talk with each other. They cooperate with each other. They draw up agreements that forms a part of convention and treaties and so on. So likewise, there are a number of things which come up. Again, another simple example before we go further, probably you will learn about this as well, or probably you've already learned about this. Like there are certain, you know, uh, I, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure whether you've heard about extradition treaties. Extradition treaties. For example, there is a criminal who has escaped from one country to another. If the other country where he is actually, uh, you know, taking shelter in some other country, and say country A and country B, there is an offense committed in country A. There is an offender who escapes to country B. In case there is extradition treaty between country A and country B, country B is expected to send back the criminal, you know, arrest the criminal and send the person to country A. Are you understanding? So that happens on the basis of a treaty between two countries, like extradition treaty. For example, you know, UAE and India has that treaty. You understand so extradition treaty so all these treaties and all those things they form as a result of diplomacy or and in fact there is a, a, a complete law on diplomacy and that is called as diplomatic law there's a complete law on that and the fundamental uh, rule of diplomatic law is that any person of a diplomatic uh, that the person of diplomatic agent is inviolable. That means you are not supposed to harm that person. So they actually enjoy a kind of, uh, you know, immunity that they should not be arrested. They should not be subject to any criminal prosecution in the state where they are representing. So, I mean, there are certain, uh, you know, laws that govern their uh, in a position actually when they represent one country in another country. So that's a different topic altogether. Well, that is just for your knowledge. Next is professional diplomats intervene, study and resolve any conflicting matters that may come to the fore, including matters that may relate to trade, commerce, international relations, human rights, and so on. Now, what is effective diplomacy? Effect, I would call, or we can call effective diplomacy as being effective when it leads to, you know, uh, the tenth in case of conflicts. What is this, the tenth? The tenth in foreign affairs and diplomatic parlance, it simply means the relaxation of conflicts. In the fourth line of the slide, you can see the word, the tenth, D-E apostrophe T-E-N-T-E. -E. So that in foreign affairs and diplomatic parlance, it simply means relaxation of conflicts. So diplomats gather information, study it, represent and further 
the interest of the country. That is, they you know promote the interest of the country and thereby invariably even you know contribute to at shaping the thoughts of the country. They represent to a certain extent either politically or even economically. However, at times it cannot be denied that diplomacy and international law stand in rivalry and are incompatible. Sometimes it becomes a problem. They stand against each other. What is the situation or why they stand against each other? Hollow diplomacy. Hollow diplomacy or weak diplomacy may lead to a domino effect, which means what is a domino effect? For example, you have a pack of cards, which are all like stacked up all together. Like say you um, stack a pack of cards like a tower. Imagine that you are building a tower with cards, you know, cards, playing cards. So you stack it up like a tower and you pull out one card, the entire uh, lot collapses. So that's called a domino effect. You pull out one, the entire pack you know, collapses. So likewise, when one government collapses, the other leaning governments, the other, you know, leaning governments fall as well. So that's a domino effect. So what leads to that is hollow diplomacy. So sometimes, therefore, diplomacy and international law can stand in rivalry. Sometimes yeah, they can be incompatible. So such imprudence must be avoided at all costs, calling for specially qualified diplomats to handle such a role with strategic protocols on behalf of the nation. Now, Britannica defines diplomacy as established method of influencing the decision and behavior of foreign governments and peoples through dialogue, negotiation, and other measures short of war or violence. Miriam's dictionary has given a very short form of uh, definition, but it says that art and practice of conducting negotiation between the nations. Then we have Free Dictionary, who says it is a science which treats with which treats of the relations and interests of nations with nations. Quincy Wright says that it's the art of negotiation. You should remember these definitions. And when you're writing definitions, it has to be in inverted commas. If you do not remember the definition and you're just writing it, then do not put inverted commas. Oxford University Press defines diplomacy as diplomacy is the art and practice of conducting negotiation between representatives of states, and it is usually it refers to international diplomacy, the conduct of international relations through the mediation of professional diplomats with regard to a full range of topical issues. Now, how does it work? This is the last slide. How does diplomacy work? Of course, through negotiation and bargaining. There are these two things that you need to remember. How does diplomacy work? Diplomacy works through negotiation and bargaining. Obviously, the diplomats are the mouthpiece for the countries that they represent. So what do they do? They negotiate, they bargain, whatever topic it may be, whatever context it is, probably a war or trade or commerce or just building relations or whatever. So it happens through negotiation and bargaining. So that is the vehicle. Diplomacy works through the vehicle of negotiation and bargaining. And each party brings their view to the table and discussions commence on the agenda. And finally, conclusions are drawn, formally executed and implemented. So this is all and the time is up. So this is all for your class. This is just the introductory class. I wanted to read through all this and come back. And next class, we will do chapter two. Chapter two, lecture two. Now, PPT presentation, this presentation, of course, and notes will be uploaded in your Google Classroom. And uh, of course, just go back and check even your assignment. Okay, so tell me uh, if you have any question and your attendance, let's take your attendance. I'll just take a snapshot of this and I've already taken your attendance even while you entered the class. Okay. Yes, madam. Those who remain, yeah, tell me. Yeah, this is uh, Ado. Okay. 
thank you uh, much appreciated i have really enjoyed throughout the class it has been very amazing thank you so much uh i wanted to ask one question about uh, you know a relationship between two countries and for me i am uh, somebody who has been in the field of protection for so long very so good. there is a law there is a law that we call a refugee law refugee law okay yes it's one of the laws uh, Mali, okay i have yeah mm. within uh, human rights so mm. it says that the international refugee of, law yeah international refugee law yes so does it mean we are not learning in in, in, in this context it's uh, not included see in the diploma of course see listen to me the context of diplomacy law i'm just going to teach you about how it is related to international law but international law itself is a very vast subject it includes international human rights it includes international humanitarian laws it includes international refugee laws it in, of course under refugee law you have got the right of asylum and so many things are included right i'm sure you know about even non refoulement and so many other things right so in this class or for the subject we are going to deal with diplomats how are they going to deal with international law as a whole of course diplomats are the one who represent the nations and they also engage into discussions with respect to refugees right or wrong okay and thank you and how can we relate now these two laws and diplomats you have said between two countries mm -hmm. so maybe if uh, somebody escapes from one country to another country then that country with a with a mutual with a bilateral relationship is they are enjoying they have to send back maybe in case we have seen several cases where politicians you know mm. and harass their opponents and then the person escapes from mm. the country then escapes to another country so and if this person is sent back to to his country he may face you know uh and his uh, life will be endangered when he returns yes then how can we now relate these two you know laws see that's what i'm saying that the refugee law is a distinct law and is a part of international law now what we are talking about diplomacy is the extent of what laws are prevalent in that particular country for example you are talking about the person who has ran away to another country right now what is the law yeah. prevalent there so we'll have to consider that particular law so international law is not a codified law you know it is not like section 1 section 2 section 3 section 4 it is like all scattered each country has its law when one country talks with another country or two three countries they come up with a convention I, or they come up with a law and they say okay state parties whoever is connected to that whoever agrees to follow that particular law will go ahead and follow that particular law right yes so it's it's like that so how would you solve is it depends upon the country two countries mm -hmm. the understanding between two nations now if the person is coming back and his life is endangered so now that's a problem so how would you solve it is that try to make laws in that area and not to endanger life because what happens this is an actually a loophole because sometimes a certain level of you know sovereignty is taken away from a particular country so there are certain matters which is difficult to be really addressed and that's why we are studying and probably in in our journey and if we get to go to that level so probably we'll be also part of it to solve certain problems good thank you yeah welcome so uh we meet again uh, next friday same time uh, uh madam before you leave uh i had shot mm -hmm. your letter i was there before the in the introduction what did you say about your assignment is what are the rules so uh, just a uh, uh, quick you know uh, yeah. just a uh, a quick feedback okay. i was not there no the problem no problem introduction okay so the assignment is already posted online in the google classroom all the 
like whatever are the rules for submitting assignment is also mentioned in Google Classroom, I would encourage submitting assignments on time. Otherwise, there's going to be deduction of minus one mark per day of default. See the last date for the submission of assignment. The next part of it is please do not engage in plagiarism. That means direct cut, copy, paste. The topic that is given to you is uh, a kind of a topic which is, you know, an interesting topic, of course, where you will have to use theory that is what you have studied or what you you need to refer some points and then give your opinion and then talk about you know the ukraine and russia war and the question is whether diplomacy can really help in ukraine and russia war so try your best and uh, online or uh, sorry on time submissions are encouraged because you know when you do things on time you don't lose marks so i would really encourage you to submit on time and even about um your you know class attendance is a must and you're graded there as well so um and of course i'm going to post the video as well in your google classroom so if you have missed anything of course you can go to the video and you can check it out yeah uh, thank you thank you yeah welcome okay then my bye bye name my name is Abdifta abdullah abdurrahman okay uh, thank you teacher Okay. I have an understand the lesson. Okay. Uh, you welcome, welcome, Mr. Madam. I'm sorry. What did you say, Abdul Fitah? Abdul Fitah Abdullahi Abdurrahman. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Okay. Bye bye. See you next class. Bye bye, all of you. Bye bye. And one minute before you go, who is Samson? Samson, what's your name? Madam, it's Muhammad Hassan Fiqi. Oh, one minute. I'll just write down your name. What's your name, Muhammad? Muhammad Hassan Fiqi. Muhammad Qasim, are you? Can you write your name? Hassan Fiqi. Hassan, Hassan. Okay, okay. Yes. Okay, Muhammad Hassan. Okay, no problem. Okay, bye bye. Thanks, bye bye. Okay. <laughs> okay.